The handouts are going around. I think it's made it to this back, one of the back tables. The letters, because you know, I, I get done so early all the time. <laughs> Chapter 3 of Revelation. We have made it to a new chapter. Sort of, right? Because we never finished anything in chapter 2. <laughs> We've got our typical identification of the addressee to the angel of the church. Now we have the identification that this one is in Sardis. Um, it was one of the premier cities of Asia Minor. Uh, in earlier times, it obtained a uh, reputation for wealth because of gold that was found in a nearby river. During the first century, it prospered from commerce and the, the fertility of the surrounding region. Uh, oldest part of the city had been built up on top of a hill and kind of, kind of uh, given it a reputation of being, uh, you, you couldn't capture it even though it had been captured two or three times in its past because the guards went to sleep. That will probably be significant later in the letter if we'll get there for it that far, right? Um, there was a powerful Jewish community in Sardis. This is part of uh, some of the synagogue there that's been excavated. And uh, you see some different things going on. Like this, an interesting thing about that altar right there. When you turn it to the side, notice what's on the side of that altar. This is at a Jewish synagogue. You have a Roman eagle. When the Romans tried to bring their standards with Roman eagles into the temple, I mean, they had a fight on their hands because they brought an idol to the temple. And you've got a synagogue here with an altar that's got Roman eagle on it. Isn't that interesting? And, um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's just kind of, you know, really weird. And, and it's here at Sardis is the one I was telling you about. This synagogue's just built next door to a Roman bath and gymnasium complex. Have I already probably told you enough about Judaism and Sardis to make some judgments on it? <laughs> These guys are probably not really Torah observing real strict Jews at Sardis, are they? They're, they're, and, and by the way, in the, in the, this is a second century one, and it's the largest Jewish synagogue that we've excavated. So it was a blow in and go in the synagogue, you know? Uh, it, it was doing well, okay? But it, it's really odd that it's next to this Roman uh, gymnasium and bathhouse. You know, uh, that's the pool and stuff from, from the gymnasium and bathhouses, and it's right next door. Uh, population of Sardis about this time was 600 to 100,000, uh, 60,000, excuse me. 60 to 100,000 people, and uh, it hosted many pagan cults, had a lot of different pagan temple stuff going on. In fact, Petronius, who was a, a writer that was from Sardis, in his work Sarticon wrote this about Sardis, deities are so prevalent in our neighborhood then you are more likely to bump into a god than a man. <laughs> Entering, interesting place, Sardis is, isn't it? It's a bit tough place to live as a Christian, isn't it? Okay. We have our, our identification of the sender, right? He's got the seven spirits of God. We didn't really deal with chapter 1 and verse 4, but we saw that that, that phrase has already occurred in the book of 1 4 from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. It's also over in chapter 4, verse 5. There are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Um, if Zechariah 4 is a legitimate background text for that, then the seven spirits are God's one spirit. And quite possibly then what this is saying is the church at Sardis 
desperately needs the experience and the reviving power of the Spirit of God. The sender is also identified as he who has the seven stars, right? We know that in three one. We saw that back in chapter one in verse sixteen and also one twenty, right? And we, he has those seven stars in your, his right hand, which you you know, the seven golden lampstands and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Like most of these congregations, there is a some words of praise for this congregation. But the words of praise have kind of got, got some bite to them too, don't they? They get praised because they've got a few people who haven't soiled their garments. Another way to say that biblically is there's a remnant of faithful people at Sardis who have not compromised with pagan society, who haven't grown spiritually complacent, who haven't grown spiritually comfortable. And we know that that can really be the case, right? We, we're no, we know Jesus is teaching, you know, there's the narrow way with few people on it. Or, or Matthew 22, verse 14, many are called, but what? Few are cho chosen. This text talks about there's a few people who have not soiled their garments. See, the, the faithful few have resisted spiritual compromise. They've resisted moral compromise. And so they're, they're portrayed as having clean clothes. Clean clothes is a good thing, isn't it? All right? Yeah, at camp, clean clothes is a good thing. Spiritually speaking, clean clothes is a good thing, okay? <laughs> And this does probably have a, a, a background in Zechariah chapter 3, beginning verse 3. Joshua, by the way, if, don't ever ask me to teach on Zechariah. That's, that's, one, that's one book I have just... Hmm. I've, I've, I've grappled with it a little bit, but it's, it's tough, man. It's tough. Now, Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. And standing before the angel, he spoke and said to those, um, uh, said to those who were standing before him, saying, "Remove the filthy garments from him." And again, he said to him, "See, I have taken your iniquity from you, and will clothe you with festal robes." Then I said, "Let them put a clean turban on his head." So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, while the angel of the Lord was standing by. Pretty clearly in the Zechariah text, the filthy garments means that you are polluted with sin. You are polluted with iniquity. And that needs to be removed. And the clean garments say you've got a standing, good standing before God. Okay? And sin and uncleanness then are, are about whatever compromises you've made to society and in your relationship with God and Christ. Now one other thing that I, I need to point out in this text, you've got a few in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. Though there, these are addressed to congregations and there is congregational judgment going on that we haven't really seen because I don't get that far in the letters. That's bad on my part. Right? Um, this text seems to tell me that one can remain faithful in a bad congregation. I'm not sure I even like saying that. But I try to go where the text leads. And if it's only a few in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, that would say that the majority of the congregation has. And that means it's a bad congregation. 
know, in our day and age, with, with our ease of transportation, it's pretty easy to bail on a bad place. And I wouldn't tell you that that's absolutely wrong. But maybe, you know, maybe sometimes we need to stick with it a little bit longer. Okay? Uh, there's a few. I think Jesus is pleased that at least he's got a few in Sardis, don't you? What, what did the few bail Sardis? What's, what's the hope for Sardis? So, kind uh, can of work that through. I, I'm, I'm not even real happy with saying some of that stuff, but again, I'm trying to go where the text leads. He's got the few who haven't sold their garments, and they, they walk with me in white, according to verse 3 4. Interesting thing, uh, the word white in your New Testament occurs more times in the book of Revelation than it, than it occurs in the t entire rest of the New Testament combined. In other words, you know, from Matthew through Jude. You've got more uses of white in Revelation than you do in Matthew through Jude. That tells you it's, it's fairly important to the book of Revelation. And let me suggest to you that again, this is another visual image and, and symbolization. Oh yeah, it's got, you know, kind of like clean clothes out of Zacharias. Surely it's at least part of the background. But it also comes from the Greco-Roman culture. Okay? And in the Gre Greco-Roman culture, white robes were something that symbolized virtue and, and, and reverence. It was, they, they had them in the mystery religions. But even maybe more important than that, in Roman society, they had a special ceremony. We're probably familiar, I'm putting a little parenthetical statement in here in mid-sentence, okay? We're probably familiar with, with Jewish coming of age as the bar mitzvahs and the bat mitzvahs, right? Okay. Roman society had a coming of age ceremony, okay? When young boys reached their middle teen years, they could wear their new garments. And they would give them the, the, the toga virilis, indicating their arrival into manhood. And that toga virilis, guess what? It was a white toga. <laughs> they have come into manhood when they get this. Okay. Now, let me push that further. The right, that rite of passage in Rome for Gaius Caesar, okay, the son of Augustus, right? We're familiar with Augustus, right? His, his son Gaius, when he reaches that point and they have that ceremony, that ceremony was acknowledged and, sever and celebrated by every one of the seven uh, churches and uh, cities in Revelation that these churches are in. They celebrated that event. And so not only does, and in Sardis, not only did this, this city have a decree that mentions prayers being offered to Augustus for the safety of his children, but the city proclaims that this day of transition from youth to manhood for Gaius Caesar was to be an annual sacred day. on which the city of Sardis will offer prayers and sacrifices to the gods, and all shall wear wreaths and festal garments. Okay. In other words, there's a pretty strong cultural background going in Sardis for getting the white garment. Okay. And everybody in Sardis is going to know that. The pagans in Sardis are going to think, oh, white garment, that's what you get when you get into manhood. And that's what we celebrate about the emperor's son, right? Jesus says, no, there's a better significance to that. That's about people who are faithful to me, okay? And, and, and in Revelation, the white garments come from Jesus, right? They're, they're worn by the faithful. And, and you get a white white garment by having your robe washed in the blood of the Lamb, 
chapter 5 and verse 9, right? And it's the faithful who are with Jesus in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, right? They're, they're the ones who are clothed in white garments, who have come out of the great tribulation. They've washed and made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. So the way to get the white robe in Revelation isn't, isn't to celebrate Caesar, but to have your robe washed by the blood of, of Christ and be faithful to Him. So you, you get the white robe, but you don't want to soil the white robe because that's how it started, right? There's a few who have not soiled their robes in Sardis. Okay? It's, the, it's the dress of the armies of heaven in chapter 19 and, and verse 4. And then 3, 4 says an interesting thing. It says they are worthy. That strikes me very odd. I don't know if it strikes you odd. Because most of the time that what I'm familiar with Scripture is there is one who is worthy. How about you? And, and most of the time we'll, we'll relate to texts about I, I'm just an unworthy servant. Right? It's in your Bible though, here in chapter 3 and verse 4, isn't it? The few in Sardis who have not soiled their robes are the ones who are worthy. It's worthy occurs seven times in, in Revelation. And I think Revelation may have a little bit different spin on this than it has in other texts in Scripture. And I think here then he's not saying worthy means you've merited something. Okay? But it seems like as it's used here in Revelation, worthy has to do with the correspondence uh, between the integrity of our... Uh, it's about the integrity of, of our faith. A, a correspondence between what we believe and how we behave. Have I talked about two wings of an airplane yet? Because okay. this worthiness seems to be based on the actions of the people in Revelation. And that's not totally at odds with the rest of your scripture. I mean, we're, we are familiar with Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. You know, Paul implores the people to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, right? Worthy of the calling by which you have been called. And we have it also over at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10 in his prayer so that you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And I think that starts to move in a little bit of the same place where this word worthy is being used in Revelation, especially here in Revelation chapter 3. Okay? But this, this worthiness then is connected to our loyalty to Christ and refusal to be polluted by the pagan surroundings. Okay? That's the words of praise. <coughs> that seems kind of short, doesn't it? And it's addressed to the few. Words of criticism. <coughs> Well, first it starts out with their reputation. I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive. Their reputation is with somebody is that they are people who are alive, right? They have a reputation, though, it seems like, because we're going to read the rest of that text. He's going to, Jesus' judgment is that you are dead, right? Uh, and so they've got a reputation without reality. And part of the question then becomes, who is this reputation with? Is, is it their reputation with the other congregations of Asia Minor? It might be. Or maybe it's a reputation in the community of Sardis. That, that the people maybe view the church in, in Sardis favorably. <coughs> the, the way the church appears in the eyes of the people of, of Sardis. 
because there's nothing in this text that seems to indicate they're experiencing any sort of persecution. So it, it may be that the non-Christians at Sardis What group has got a big synagogue there? The Jews. And so far in Revelation, we've seen the Jews usually aren't getting along too well with the Christians. And yet, it doesn't look like we've got persecution here, even with a large Jewish population. Isn't that interesting? And it's a large Jewish population that looks like from the remains of the synagogue that has uh, accommodated to pagan culture fairly well. But it looks like the non-Christians at Sardis saw the church as, as a respectable group of people who weren't very dangerous. Maybe not very desirable either. Decent folk, right? In Sardis, in Sardis the Christians look a whole lot like everybody else. G.B. Caird, in his commentary on Revelation, that I don't even know it's in print anymore. It was it used to be in the little, it was a Revelation volume in the old uh, Harper's New Testament commentary that's been replaced by an updated volume. His comment on this text is Sardis was the perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. <laughs> Let that one sink in. The perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. See, their external appearance looks good, but their internal <coughs> character is flawed. Jesus is going to say, you've got no life. Instead of moving forward spiritually, this, this congregation is resting on its reputation. And, and there's a play going on on the word name in this text. Okay? You've got a name that you're alive, right? You've got this reputation that you're, you're alive, okay? So, but it's, it's the word name there in 3 1. You may have rep reputation going on there. But by the time you get to 3 4, although there are only a few people, and the word is names again there, who have not compromised. And then you get down to verse 5, to the faithful Jesus promises not to blot their names out of the book of life, but instead he acknowledges their names before the Father. So the few, there's a few names Jesus is going to do well with, but the congregation on the whole's got a good name, but not with God. Can that happen today? Do I need to even ask the question? Okay. And so you see in 3 1 the judgment of Christ concerning the, their situation, and he says, You're dead. See, the problem there is the majority of the believers in Sardis have a reputation that doesn't match the reality of Jesus' diagnosis of their spiritual condition. <laughs> Probably everyone in the church at Sardis thinks they're alive. You with me here? I don't think you're in the church at Sardis thinking I'm dead. So when you, when you get this letter from Jesus and it says, hey, the majority of you are dead, you're probably not going to react too well to that. What's he talking about? You know, I'm alive. You see, again, I think there's probably a lot of folks who read this thing that's getting addressed to that aren't going to like what John's got to say and will react very negatively to it. <coughs> because everyone thinks, probably thinks they're alive. If Jesus says you're dead or about to die, doesn't he? In other words, there's a significant gap between the reality of their lives as seen by God and their reputation with the people. Right? God's has and, and one of the things Re Revelation is really clear on is we've got to get God's perspective on things. 
And here God's perspective for this congregation is DOA. Right? That's not what they think of themselves, right? And so he, so he says, you're dead. That cross, common word in your New Testament. Paul will use this a couple of times in reference to, to people who are spiritually dead. Right? You're dead in your transgressions and sins. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Colossians 2 and verse 13. Dead in your transgressions and sin. You know, the, the unconverted, the non-saved person, that's what Paul's described. They're not the person that, like our old tracks, just kind of drowning out wanting to have a life preserver for, thrown to them. Dead is dead. If you're dead, a life preserver doesn't help you very much. Right? But apparently they're not totally dead at this point because there's still some hope. They're terminal, but there's still the possibility of life. But boy, I tell you what, the EKG is pretty slim. So you, you have this exhortation that they are almost terminal. terminal. In verse 2, he says, Wake up, strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die. Think like a tree for a moment. Yes, I ask you to do that. If you're in a tree, if you're a tree in an orchard and every tree in the orchard is diseased and you are too, what do you think? I'm normal. With me here? You know how that's how trees think, right? <laughs> right? You, you, you know that, right? It, 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 but if, if the whole orchard's diseased, each diseased tree thinks it's normal. It doesn't know it's sick. It's easy. It's easy for churches to be deceived. There, there's a disparity going on here at, at Sardis between the way God views these, uh, this church and really all the churches of Asia, right? And the way that they seem to perceive themselves and the ways that others perceive them. You know, why, why is it so hard for us to see ourselves the way we really are? I, I don't expect answers to come flowing in, but, but I want that to be a question that rattles around your mind. Because that, that's pretty clearly what's going on here, that they are having a hard time seeing themselves the way they really are. And, 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 and is, there, is there some way that we can, you know, that, that our self-understanding can align more with God's view of who we are and, and get us there, you know? Uh, well, we need to do this. We need to be there because these, this, these letters indicate that we have a hard time doing that. And notice I'm saying we. I'm not saying you or y'all. Right? But I'm saying we. And so he says, wake up, which is probably the idea of spiritual sleep. Right? You see that kind of in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14. Wake up, sleeper, a letter addressed to the church, right? And the sleeper is told to wake up. You know, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Spiritual sleep. Well, and some, some people think we're, that that's talking about conversion. But now Paul's applying it to, to Christians, right? In Ephesians 5. Well, what, what is that? Well, in one sense, the Christian life is a continual rep uh, repetition of what happened at conversion, right? It, it's kind of like breathing. You take your initial breath, but if you quit taking breaths after that, what's going to happen to you? You're going to turn blue, you're going to pass out, you know. <laughs> it's not going to be good, right? 
You take your initial breath, but you got to keep breathing. Wake up! Get out of that spiritual sleep. You have the same kind of thing going on here in chapter 13 of Romans, in verse 11, you know? The hour is already there for you to awaken from your sleep. Salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. And then Christ issues five commands. Again, that's why the image in chapter 1 of the scary Jesus is pretty important. The, the cuddly Jesus of, of contemporary theology isn't going to issue five commands. Right? The feel-good Jesus is not going to issue five commands. Right? But the scary Jesus... He won't mince words. He'll tell his people what they need to hear. So in Revelation 3, 2, wake up and strengthen the things that remain which, which you were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you will not wake up, bad things are going to happen. Okay? Jesus addresses the church at Sardis with more commands than he does any other congregation here in chapters 2 and 3. They have seven commands addressed to him. This church is in trouble. Okay? First thing he tells them to do is, 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 to, is to wake up. All right? Wake up. Again, that may reflect the city's history of two times in their, two or three times in their, their history they were captured by stealth while the soldiers were asleep. Uh, that may be what's going on here. It may be die of wake up, or you can translate this thing, be watchful. This is, this is the same kind of uh, terminology that Jesus uses about second coming stuff. Uh, uh, be awake, be alert, you know. Uh, you don't know at what hour the Master is going to come. In, in essence, Jesus is telling this church to realize their condition and be willing to do something about it. Get an honest self-awareness that something's wrong and become spiritually alert because you're not spiritually alert right now. Okay? And he says this church is kind of like members of a household who are kind of comfortably asleep, unaware that, that an intruder has come into their midst. Right? Paul uses that kind of imagery in, in, uh, in 5.6. He tells them to strengthen the things that remain, okay? They can't stay where they're at and be in a good place. So some direct and immediate action is, is needed. They need to remember, right? Live up to and recapture their earlier moral and spiritual standings. Now, most of this congregation is dead. Few haven't soiled their garments. When they need to remember probably the last place that John wants them to go to get good information is the teaching of that congregation. Because what's been teaching there has got them into death. They're going to need the rest of their New Testament. They're going to need this document of Revelation. But the stuff they're probably being taught is not the good stuff that's going to get them out of death. It's the, it's the stuff that's going to keep them dead. Okay? So remember. Okay? And, and again, because part of what they're currently getting is keeping them deceived. Because you can be dead and think that you're alive. And there's, there's often others around us who will help us in our deception and contribute to the deception. So, so wake up and strengthen and remember and obey, right? Do the things that are right, because obedience leads to righteousness. That's what Paul wrote about in Romans 6.16. 6, okay? Faithfully keeping covenant deeds constitutes the path to life. And repent. You know? Do the things that are right. I'm about out of time, and I, I've been hit repentance, and I haven't got this one in yet, so. You know, we know repentance is what? Changing your mind and changing your actions, turning and going a different direction. 
When the Christian is told to repent, maybe, maybe one of the images that we need to associate with that is the image of coming home. Like the prodigal son, right? He's home. He decides he wants to be rebellious. He leaves, but he comes to his senses and he comes home. For the Christian, you've been home with God, but if you're in need of repentance, that means you've been rebellious, you've lost your way, you've left home, and now it's time to come home. It's time to come home. And I don't know if that will help us in talking to people about repentance, especially Christians, but that seems to be a, a little better edge on some things than maybe we hear the harshness of repentance. It, it, it's communicating that same idea, but maybe in a, in a way that will communicate a little bit better in our culture. It, it's time to come home. It's time, it's time to come home and live by, by the Father's house rules, you know? And, and they've got incomplete deeds, right? He finds their de deeds incomplete. That, that's much like what we saw at Ephesus in chapters 2, 4, in chapter 2, 4, and 5, okay? And it looks like maybe they're, they're here at Sardis just content with incomplete deeds and incomplete obedience. But that's part of the reason for the situation that they're in. And so Jesus says he's going to be coming like this thief in the night. Hear this one clearly. This is not second coming stuff here. It's language like second coming stuff, but it's coming in judgment in time based on whether this congregation wakes up or not. And also hear this one, because this gets, gets misperceived too. This is not Christ coming in judgment on the city of Sardis. That's not who he's addressed to here. This is Christ coming in judgment on the church in Sardis. Right? Unless they change, unless they repent, unless they come home, he will come in time, in judgment, on them like a thief in the night. And he's using in time language to communicate that kind of idea. I got closer to being done. Maybe Friday I'll succeed. I don't know. Thank you.